ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zipper Hall at the Pole Dance School. In case of emergency, please take a moment to locate the exit nearest you. As a courtesy to performers and audience, please silence all cell phones and other electronic devices. Thank you and enjoy the program. Welcome to the Broad's Unprivate Collection talk series with artists Christopher Wool and Kim Gordon, moderated by John Corbett. I'm Joanne Heiler, founding director of the Broad. The program today launches our celebration of the Broad Museum's fifth anniversary, and it also continues our Unprivate Collection conversations, a series featuring the voices of artists and cultural leaders. We conceived the series back in 2013 as a way to introduce the Broad Collection and its artists to the public before the museum opened, but we've kept them going long after our doors did open in 2015. We've presented the unprivate uh, collections conversations all over the city. To name just a few, in 2014, Eric Fischel spoke about his work with actor, comedian, and art collector Steve Martin. Later the same year, artist Kara Walker spoke with filmmaker Ava DuVernay. Last year, Britain-based artist Jenny Saville was in conversation with scholar Jennifer Doyle. While the Broad Museum is now five years old, its success is the result of a sustained five-decade-long journey through collecting by our founders and incomparable LA philanthropist, Eli and Edie Broad. Decades ago, their attraction to contemporary art was grounded in their delight in getting to know artists and exploring the full scope of artists' careers over time. Under the roof of the Broad Museum now are the truly distinctive results of this. In some cases, the works of individual artists are so deeply held that the Broad Museum can offer our audience a constellation of mini retrospectives from its own collection. Throughout our fifth anniversary years and year in a variety of ways, we are celebrating a selection of the artists represented in this kind of depth. Between now and September, we will unveil a sequence of monograph galleries featuring many of the artists the Broads have collected with devotion and longevity. Last week, we opened a string of galleries with 16 works by today's speaker, Christopher Wool, that span more than three decades of his work. Next, our first floor galleries will bring together four LA-based artists held deeply in the collection. It'll open in early April with a title inspired by the LA icon, the late artist John Baldessari, using a quintessentially Baldessari phrase, desire, knowledge, and hope with smog. <laughs> in addition to work by Baldessari will be works and large-scale installations by Mike Kelly, Barbara Kruger, and Ed Ruscha. Ed will be featured, by the way, as our next unprivate collection talk. Uh, he'll be featured on April 11th. And the rest of 2020 will bring more new installations to see in our galleries, including an exhibition of recent acquisitions and also a big public anniversary celebration in September. Please keep an eye out for our updates in the coming months about that. For today's event, we are thrilled to be hosting Christopher. Christopher will be joined in conversation by Kim Gordon, the visual artist and founding member of the legendary rock band Sonic Youth. Their conversation will be moderated by John Corbett, a music critic, record producer, and curator, and the co-owner of the Corbett versus Dempsey Gallery in Chicago. For all three of today's participants, the interplay of visual art and music have shaped their respective creative practices and their careers. Born in Chicago, Christopher moved to New York in the 1970s and studied art with post-war abstract painters including Richard Pousset Dart and Jack Torkoff. Christopher also became an active part of the 70s New York counterculture defined by hybridity and cross-pollination between art forms, including photography, film, and music in the punk and no-wave scenes, all of which stirred debate about whether painting still held relevance as an artistic medium. As a visual artist, Christopher has taken this debate head on and interrogates painting's traditional terms, namely composition, gesture, and materials. Keying into the urban aesthetics of New York, mechanical processes, 
and methods of repetition and reproduction. He has used decorative rollers, found text, stencils, stamps, silk screens, clip art, and even his own work as an image bank for generating paintings. Christopher's practice expresses uncertainty about painting's future while paradoxically pushing the medium forward into new visual territories. His influential work has been collected and exhibited by institutions around the world for decades. A quick note, if you uh, didn't yet have a chance to see his installation at the Broad today, head over after this talk and you can just show your ticket from this talk at our front entrance and get admission right away to the museum. While Kim Gordon was raised in LA, she moved to New York in 1980 to pursue a career in art after graduating from Otis College of Art and Design. There, like Christopher, she became interested in the no-wave scene, which experimented with noise, dissonance, and atonality in reaction to punk rock's recycling of rock and roll cliches. She formed Sonic Youth in 1981, which went on to garner wide acclaim and is now considered to be a pivotal influence on the alternative and indie rock movements. Kim has worked consistently across disciplines and distinct cultural fields, including art, design, writing, fashion, music, film, and video. Her memoir, Girl in a Band, chronicling her childhood, life, her childhood and her life in art and music, was published in 2015. Kim has also been a longtime collaborator with The Broad. She performed at a previous unprivate collection event in 2017, and last year, Kim performed with Yoshimi O oh at our Summer Happenings event just before her first solo record was released to overwhelmingly positive reviews. Before I bring out Christopher, Kim, and John, I want to gratefully acknowledge our longtime leading partner and the exclusive presenting sponsor of our fifth anniversary year, East West Bank. With their generous support, we've been able to expand our arts education programs and family offerings, as well as host thought-provoking thought events such as these, as part of our mission to make contemporary art accessible to the widest possible audience. And with that, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Christopher Wool, Kim Gordon, and John Corbett. Thank you. guys good <laughs> so far so good all right um, this is a real honor I have to say um, we're gonna talk I think a little bit I'm gonna steer us in the direction of talking a little bit about uh, about history and talking a little bit about the um, the downtown New York scene of the late 1970s, early 1980s, into the 80s. And it's a scene that both of you guys came to from elsewhere, uh, which is really interesting to me. Kim, you came from here. Right. And uh, Christopher from Chicago. And so I wanted to maybe just start by asking you to each talk a little bit about first impressions of New York when you arrived there and also a little bit about what drew you to New York. <laughs> well, um, I went to New York to do visual art, basically, um, you know, inspired by artists from the 70s and 60s that I'd read about, and I kind of felt like um, living in Los Angeles, I, I, or I felt like I needed to be somewhere I could was really motivated by the energy around me. And um, in LA, I didn't feel such a gravitational pull. And I also felt like LA at the time really did seem to be a place that was just money and status. And you know, every time you got in your car, you were reminded about money. And when I moved to New York, it was very much um, like a, uh, a city uh, disintegrating, <laughs> at least downtown. You know, garbage strikes, lots of giant rats running around. Um, 
I think um, it had just gotten out of bankrupt, uh, bankruptcy. And, um, but, and it made me something kind of familiar to me because I lived in Hong Kong for a year when I was 12. And I just something about the density and the noise and the smells and it being sort of chaotic that I really liked. You moved there in 1980, right? Yes, yeah, 1980. I, I, I kind of went there for six months, maybe 79. I remember being there when um, Sid and Nancy <laughs> were making the headlines in the Post. <laughs> and yeah. It was very dramatic. Christopher, you moved there earlier, right? You were there... Well, a few years. I moved, uh, moved to... I, I, I went to New York right after graduating high school. Um, is this okay? Um, uh, I, I didn't know, I had no idea what was going on. I, first of all, I was really, I feel very lucky. I was, uh, I'm a, a, I kind of killed it with being born when I was born. So I grew up in Chicago in the 60s, which was an incredible uh, experience. And then as we're going to talk about, New York was the timing, coming to New York in the mid 70s was mm -hmm. kind of ideal. And uh, if we look back now, almost all of that is gone. There's not much of w what we came to New York mm -hmm. for left anymore. Um, but I came in, the, uh, my father was from the East Coast and always spoke, he was an enthusiast of New York. So uh, I, I, must have followed him in some way. Um, and I, I remember my very first New York impression because it was strong and it was in the neighborhood I ended up living in, which is downtown. Um, and compared to Chicago, it was so dark and so, so Allen Street is particularly dark street. And my father took me to the old Jewish restaurants on Allen Street. Um, and I, it was unsettling. I'd never, well, it was exciting. Uh, and I never, uh, I never lost that first impression. Ended up living in Chinatown, which is not very far away, and I did a lot of photography and uh, documenting that neighborhood because it had such a strong impression on me when I first was there. One of the impressions that I have of that period uh, of New York is that it was, there was this kind of profound interdisciplinarity. Uh, and in a way, it was a, more of an attitude than it was um, medium specificity. So people were, so the sense of moving back and forth between doing one thing, you were an artist. If you were an artist, you were an artist. You weren't necessarily strictly a painter or a musician. And so I'm kind of interested in that sense of, uh, of the moving between and the interest in different mediums. So I thought maybe we could talk, move from one medium to another, and just mm -hmm. asking you a little bit about that, but maybe your impressions of that, if, that's, if that seems accurate to you. Well, I think maybe that comes out of um, the 70s in New York, you know, where people were involved with work that was more process-oriented or... Um, or even the 60s, you know, um, that wasn't um, specifically kind of community-oriented more than, than commercial and product-oriented. And, um, yeah, I mean, I actually... So when I moved there, I knew not that many people, but I knew Dan Graham, who introduced me to the no-wave scene and no-wave bands. And a lot of those musicians were actually had moved there as artists. And um, I, I, a lot of um, the artists like, well, I think like Robert Longo and people like that who played in bands, um, you know, it was before they, were, they got serious about their careers. I think they were like, you know, it was just kind of more of a, um, a less professional sort of time. And um, I found, uh, I was really just struck by the music, this abstract music that wasn't conventional. It didn't really sound like punk music and it didn't follow any kind of like, it wasn't like jazz, it wasn't like free jazz. It was um, really like 
expressionistic, and um, I felt like there was something really pure about it. Um, yeah, just and that really interested me. Yeah, I mean, there. It's interesting how many musicians in that scene were were also visual artists and had even mm -hmm. suicide, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, and in um, various of the no wave bands, you had people who were also quite active. And James Nairs was in the court contortions, and mm -hmm. so yeah. So let's start with music. Talking a little bit about music. I know music was really important for you as an as a you were a habitué of various well, again, spaces. I, I had been really lucky. I grew up in in Hyde Park in Chicago, and the ACM and the art ensemble had. I, I, told the story, but I was 12 years old when I first saw them because a colleague of my father's was involved. Um, but, uh, I did an interview with someone once and they started the interview by saying, I understand you like music. And I, <laughs> I, I have never met anyone who said, I don't like music. Um, but I'm not, I was, I'm not a musician. And I, the whole interdisciplinary thing was, it doesn't really describe, it describes my interests, but not mm. my practice. But I, I think um, there, were, there were two things, again, to the timing, there were two things happening in the 70s that, that uh, you know, all, so many of the musicians were coming out of art school, I think, mm -hmm. right? Was, um, but also there was this kind of, it's often hard for me to talk about, but postmodernism uh, had, uh, strains to it that encouraged uh, non-professional attitudes toward things. That you could, uh, well, the DIY mm -hmm. idea and that you could do mm -hmm. what you want. I remember reading Ardo saying... Uh, Ardo Lindsay. Ardo Lindsay, we were talking about him before, but a, a musician mm -hmm. colleague. Um, that uh, they, gave, they, they got instruments and gave them three three months to learn how to play and they were gonna perform after three months no matter what happened. Of course, Ardo's a spectacular guitarist now. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some way I think um, it's possible in a way for music to be a critique about the world um, in a way that art can't be. But yet, and maybe it's because it's impossible to really distill music um, I mean, of course, it de I mean, even pop music, I mean, um, and I think that's, you know, why it's hard to write off it off as a just populist form. I mean, there's so many different, like in art, there's so many different, you know, variants of the value of it, but I, I feel like what they call art music, <laughs> can be more of a critique of, of the world. Hmm. That's interesting. I'm, I'm interested in music as a locus for so much. I mean, it's also, it's also a social thing, people getting mm -hmm. together, audiences getting together, musicians and audiences getting together on, you know, with a stage mm -hmm. performance, but then also after the fact, kind of hanging out in the bar type settings that were where the no wave bands were playing. And um, it, it's interesting to me, because also that DIY attitude and the fact that you could not know how to play, you had no, you didn't necessarily have any kind of schooling in mm -hmm. doing that. You could there, like Ikawe Mori is a great example of somebody who didn't know how to play the drums at all, and then played the drums mm -hmm. and played it quite spectacularly. Three months. She was in DNA. So she oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so that I'm interested in how that attitude then also did that have an influence on the way that you were each thinking about other things that you were doing. If you mm -hmm. were in terms of making artwork, in terms of I'm mean, also very interested in the film world at that time in New York, the downtown New York, the no wave film world, for instance. Uh, which I know both of you have had long-standing interest in and uh, mm -hmm. and involvement in. I don't know the the um, 
film world than um, No Wave Films or No Wave Cinema. I mean, to me, that was kind of glamorous. I don't know. Like, it was kind of um, a world that I was so interested in, but I never really, I mean, I knew some people who, like Beth and Scott B, but I, it was not a world, I was pretty intimidated by it, actually. Mm. But um, I don't know. I mean, it's just, um, you know, Jonas Migas, Warhol, the factory, the sort of community aspect of collaborative art making is very appealing and just kind of, um, um, that's kind of how I thought of New York and the, you know, the Judson um, dance group. I mean, that was all really what wanted me to move to New York for. Um, what, what, about theater and <laughs> what about theater and performance? I'm thinking about like... What's the, that? What about theater and performance? Like the living theater and uh, some of the kind of stuff that crossed over into punk from the performance world. I mean, I didn't really know that world, but I, but, I mean, definitely like the punk aesthetic of that kind of transferred into the sort of the no-wave scene. Um, it, you know, to... Like, I never consider myself a musician, and it almost became my work not to really learn how to play very well, or to kind of maintain, it wasn't ever about how well you could play, it was about your ideas. Mm. Um, and, I, and I think that to me is what transfers over to my art practice, is not um, being able to paint well, although the aesthetic of being a, you know, Sloppy is also something I don't really aspire to either. Um, but it's just a kind of one aesthetic of different aesthetics depending on what the idea is. And um, so I, I just think that it do, does still come down to the idea is the most important thing. Like, I, I don't, I would never. You know, like I'm not drawn to um, music because someone can play the guitar really well, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not drawn to art in that way either. It feels like attitude was a big part of, of. Yeah, punk is an attitude. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't forget what whose lyric that is, <laughs> but um, it's um, you know, I, and it, I just feel like my urge is always to go whatever is going to go against the grain of authority um, or convention, but not um, the sole reason, but it's definitely like a driving energy. Hmm. Do you think about things that way? Yeah, and I think there are parallels to painting for sure. I don't, actually more than parallels, it's all the same. Um, well, maybe not the community, uh, the community hmm. side of it, but there, you know, there was a bad painting uh, movement and uh, it, was a, it wasn't well. We were able to do worse after <laughs> bad painting, um, uh, but and 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 painters have always uh, used uh, techniques to, or strategies to distance themselves mm -hmm. from from their um, virtuosity. Uh, you know, even Bryce Martin using a stick, or de Kooning using a, a brush, uh, brush on a stick. Um, uh, but it was a time where people were really challenging things, mm -hmm. and challenging um, uh, not just the things themselves, but the structures around them. But it, it was. It was inseparable from the economy, and it, it, it was something international on some level, I, I'm, I think. And it was a confluence of things that led to a, a really creative mm -hmm. period in a lot of ways. And those filmmakers were particularly influential for me. The, the, the new cinema, which was the Super 8 mm -hmm. group, uh, of, of no-wave cinema uh, 
was, well, I was, I was going to hear music, and I was, I, I was not involved with any of this. I was a fan and audience. I was not, I was still uh, trying to teach myself to paint. Um, but that group of filmmakers, Eric Mitchell, James Nares, John Lurie, uh, really was, it, it intimidated me. I did get to know some of them. Oh, actually, I tried to go to film school. Um, lost, Could you talk for a second about <laughs> that? I lost a year there. <laughs> I, I, it was not for me, but I, I went to NYU, um, which I didn't know it, but was the film school to go to. Uh, uh, suppose Spike Lee and Jarmish had just uh, been there ahead of me, but and you, I was unaware of that. Jarmish, no, everyone, you were, they hadn't you, made films yet. Jarmish asked you to be in one of his <laughs> films. Yes. Come on. Oh, which one? Uh, Stranger Than Paradise. The and first, and uh, which character would you have played? The Ed, Richard Edson character. Oh. But I told him I can't act, so. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I, every once in a while, will just sit there and try to imagine that film with you in that role. Oh, come on. He gave one of the most spectacular performances. Yeah. It would have... If I'd been in it, we wouldn't be talking about it because no one would have seen it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it was I think Richard Edson's a, a Richard Edson's a photographer now and lives Is in he? Los Angeles. Such a great <laughs> actor. And I knew John a little bit. I I knew John a little bit. Yeah. I want to go back to postmodernism for a second, and actually, I want to just ask a little bit about um, about some ideas around that uh, concept, particularly about uh, the word irony and what that meant within the context of the early 80s in New York for you guys. Hmm. <laughs> um, I don't I think irony really played a big part in the 80s. I, I feel like, um, I don't know, like it, punk music, there really wasn't any irony. You know, I, I always interpreted um, wearing bondage as not being into bondage or making, it was more like society's put you in, put me in bondage. Mm -hmm. Um, as a statement. And I feel like that aesthetic kind of carried into um, the 80s, you know, like sh appropriation, like Sherry Levine. Yeah. Like, like, you could say it's ironic, but it's not really, um, you know. Feels to me like there were some, uh, in the music world, there were, there were certain acts, certain musicians who were very let's say, uh, genuine and, they're, and righteous and had a mm -hmm. kind of, and then there were a, a lot of people mm -hmm. also who were dealing with something that was very s sort of had one or another version of irony, like some kind mm -hmm. of either a snotty mm -hmm. attitude yeah. or uh, making fun of authority by adopting authority mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. things like. Yeah, things I like guess, I mean, it's easier for me to see in music than it is in the, the art world, but. It, I, uh, um, you know, like, was Jack Goldstein ironic with those <laughs> paintings that were based on that? Um, the, this, uh, uh, irony is one of those <laughs> phrases that I've, uh, or words that I, I've always had trouble with. I can't define it. And mm -hmm. I, I've, uh, I know my wife and I would talk about it sometimes. And it, I, so what... Uh, oh, don't ask me to define I mean, are the, are irony. The, were yeah. the Ramones... The yeah. Ramones were... Using irony. I think so. I mean, you know, Sonic Youth used irony, and um, but we used it not all the time. Like we used it, like so nobody could really figure out if we were being ironic or not. Right, right. <laughs> uh, but th that film, 1991, the year punk broke, um, that was very ironic. And I showed it to this friend of mine who we we're doing it, working on a project with, and she's you know a lot younger, and she's like, oh my god. The 90s were so ironic. <laughs> like, he, like she, it was a completely a different aesthetic to right. her. Yeah, I mean, I think p 
people use irony differently. I mean, there are certain, I, I've always felt like there are certain uh, figures who use irony as a defense mechanism, as a way of kind of buffering themselves mm -hmm. from becoming uh, uh, unassailable. And then there are other ways of using it where a certain kind of vulnerability is mixed with these other attitudes. And so I, I still have trouble with it. When, so, I mean, I, I've often heard that Julian Schnabel represented the, mo the, the strongest position of irony, and I, that's just not true. <laughs> right. No. But I mean, if you do something and you're making fun of it or making a statement about it, you are still doing it. Right. In a way, right? Is that what you mean, Chris? <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think when I uh, take a photo of a painting and print that image, is that irony? <laughs> I guess maybe I guess, you've answered I guess your there own are question. Degrees. It's not black and white. It's not ironic or not ironic. There are degrees of irony. I think I think there's a little bit of irony there. But well, okay. So let's not let's not get settled into the word irony. But I mean, there, these are all we're talking about different kind of distanciation techniques, like ways of of taking uh, of being meta in relation to something, right? So like you have a painting and then you have a photograph of a painting and then you can have or you can have a painting that uses uh, a photographic image of another painting and, that you then do something to and those all have some kind of increasingly distanced relationship from the original so this is kind of these are all things mm -hmm. that circulate within that same area of that was fuel for the word postmodernism that was just gonna, yes that's mm -hmm. exactly there there are all these elements to uh, postmodern is such a, a a loaded and awful description of what uh, what was kind of a revolution in the aesthetic. It became yeah, I it can't. became well. It unfortunately turned into a term that meant something like pastiche. It meant like a, like a, a patchwork of different styles but it could also be many other different things. It had to do with a particular attitude towards originality or the original. Uh, and then in one way, and in some ways also not believing in the original. Yeah, I, I thought it was just a critique of what, you know, what became known as pure, was the norm of a pure form or something of right. you know, modernism and then one of the important ways for me, which was a painting thing, well, it must have been true for musicians and filmmakers also, um, the, the idea that modernism was about a masterpiece, right? Mm -hmm. a, a, a kind of um, objective idea of what quality was. And all of a sudden, we, everyone realized how interesting a lack of quality or how viable a lack of, and that just opened up everything. Um. Yeah, I still think it's, um, yeah, and even now, like it's just hard to make something that's awkward, hmm. you know, in music or art, you know, because it, it's just, because everything has been, you know, played out in so many but different variations of postmodernism. <laughs> It's very hard to just achieve something awkward. Yeah. I, I think that interesting, I'm interested in that idea of the masterpiece too, because the other thing is a masterpiece suggests a final state, a very final state. Yeah. And just what- finishing a, Just finishing a painting. Um, oh, I see what you're doing with the microphones. I got it now. You're turning <laughs> them on, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I think maybe you, you should leave that right where it is. <laughs> it's not that he's turning mine off when you talk. Yeah, so. But you okay. pull forward and um, you'll signal that you're going to talk. Okay, so, serious now. Um, Drop your hand. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't do this very often. <laughs> um, you know, we were taught 
my one year in art school, um, that you, to finish a painting, you're looking for the perfect moment. Yeah. And I remember as a young artist, just being excited about trying to figure out what the moment before that perfect moment was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the moment after is kind of easy because you end up there by accident all the time, but try, trying to finish a painting before it's finished by modernist standards, things like that were, mm -hmm. all, I mean, I was so young, I assumed these were new things. Maybe they had always been around, I don't know. Well, that's, I mean, that goes back to what you were saying about the process, like the influence of process art, for instance, that there was a thing of, that there was a sense of art not only being an arrow that points at the end result, but that it also has to do with what gets you there and then how you look at the thing in relation to what gets you there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm interested in this sense also of their, like the dub reggae idea of there not necessarily being an end point, but the fact that the end point is always a beginning for something else, which is a kind of a classic multi-track recording idea. You can always change it. And it's also something that uh, is a, became a big painting idea at a certain point of being able to then constantly shift and uh, a painting becomes a sort of a way station for the ideas that, as they are at that moment, that can then go on to do something else. So that's a, it feels like a place that, where there's a really natural relationship between music and, and, and painting. So is that like um, comparable to Warhol's Elvis painting show where he painted a long, um, a roll of canvas, sent it to the gallery and said, cut it into 13 pieces. But he, mm -hmm. he wouldn't say where, so, I mean, that's. Yeah, sure. Similar, it's, um, yeah, similar. Yeah, I mean, in, yeah, improv music, I mean, it's kind of more about just the ride, the duration. I mean, people can try to make it into a, uh, something that sounds deliberate. I mean, I do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, it's, for the most part, it's just the experience being ex the whole time. And the shared experience of being an audience that's yeah. with That'll never be repeated again. Yeah, so. that, Bar that Eric Dolphy quote about like, right. once it's in the air, it's, it's gone, over. it's yeah. over. Yeah. So maybe we can, draw this forward a little bit to sort of talk about how that set of uh, ideas and experiences in that period ha has a continuing life in your work and, uh, and ways in which you might feel that it doesn't. Like, what have you left behind and what have you kept from that downtown New York late 70s, early 80s? Um. Well, I mean, I could. I mean, it's easiest for me to speak about it musically, and the when I just did this solo record, and I sort of drew from the things that excited me about playing music to begin with, like um, Ardo Lindsay's guitar playing, or um, just or you know the fall, you know, mm. and how. Um, and then the falls music, his lyrics were sort of a critique of things, and um, and how I just felt like there's not enough of that in the world right now. So that was kind of my main motivation. But it's still the thing that um, inspires me. Really, Dis you dissonant <laughs> dissonant music, but also with a beat. <laughs> the new record is so great. I have to uh, say. I think it's fantastic, right? Oh, no. Completely great. <laughs> I didn't mean to plug it. <laughs> yeah. I did um, mean to plug it for <laughs> <you>. <laughs> Let me take my jacket off. <laughs> Christopher, how about, how about you? How do you, do you have I a sense of... I don't of know. I don't know. <laughs> it's because, hard. Uh, I, we wouldn't want to lose all that. That's and I don't think I have, but I I also find myself, I think you started to 
certain things started to become cliche. You could, uh, of course, you had to move on. So I've found, you know, the only example I can think of is with f photography. Um, I, I got a lot of visual satisfaction out of a copy machine. Um, I, I don't think I would do that now. It would feel, uh, it would feel, uh, or I, I would have to do it in a, in a, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, maybe, I mean, part of the thing that also has to do with is what, you know, what's, the relationship of the New York of that period to the New York of now. I mean, you're not living in New York now. No, I go there enough to see, experience it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I but mean, it's, you know, like New York to me now is like, a, it's a luxury good that Bloomberg made, basically. I mean, it, it's, you know, been evolving slowly, but, um, you know, just open the gates to real estate developers who build condos for people who invest in them and don't live there, which takes away from the community. And, um, you know, so, but I, you know, there, New York will always have this energy that's great and um, sexy and, and good times, money and good times. <laughs> but, um, um, it, I, you know, having the distance of living in California, um, I really do kind of understand more about the elitist bubble of New York, mm. in a way, and I, and I have to say it, I even in the art world, um, and uh, anyway, I, but I, I, you know, it's fun. Can you to can go you there. talk for a second about your family's history in in California because it's really fascinating? Um, well, I guess they started out as sort of gold rushers, <laughs> and uh, you know, I think came what is it, forty nine or fifty nine, whenever it was. Um, and Eight, 18, right? Yeah. 1849. 18, 18. Did I say 19? Okay. You just said 49. You know, they, um, yeah, this um, had a chili pepper farm with Japanese uh, at one point, and there's like a, a street named after them. And um, so I kind of I do feel um, a big draw here. And, you know, when I read Joan Didion, I think about, I, re I relate. Yeah. <laughs> in a way, so you, deeply. Was a, your family was like a pioneer family of California. Yeah, the wi yeah my, on my mom's side, yeah. The women were very stoic kind of pioneers who came for adventure, I guess. Isn't that why people came to California? Right. Um, not for security, but for... Adventure. Well, for money, probably. Money, right. Yeah. But cool. Uh, how did we get there again? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, how about your impression, still living in in, uh, in New York, uh, of the New York now versus the no wave era? Uh, sometimes it's hard for me to. It, it's changed so much, I think. But some of it is is have I just gotten older? Um, but no, it. I mean, and I'm not just living in New York. I'm in Manhattan, which is. New York on space. I mean, there are still communities in Brooklyn and and Queens and the Bronx. Manhattan is just as uh, Kim described it. It's quite soulless. Um, but maybe I'm just older and jaded. I don't know. The Art Ensemble of Chicago had a, uh, I think Lester Bowie had a composition once for the Art Ensemble called New York is Full of Lonely People which as someone who was coming to New York always from the outside uh, was very, uh, it, it described something. It also, on the other hand, wasn't so accurate. I mean, that was like a Chicagoan looking at... at uh, New York can be York. pretty welcoming. To, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean. For sure. I mean, it's interesting. I think it gets a bad rap for being full of people who are I mean, we too we're, busy. So we're part-time in <laughs> small town in Texas, and... Uh, I'm starting to realize this after 14 years there. Um, moving there is you're you're on some level invading a community. When you move to New York, mm -hmm. there, you're not you're, you're not seen as an invader. You're just part of the fabric. Yeah, but now if you're moving to like Bed Stuy 
or some neighborhood that's starting to get yeah, your, yeah. you know, I mean, unfortunately, artists are always on the front line of gentrification and because they're always looking, you know, for cheap places. Yeah, sure. You know? So, but, um, you know, so it's, uh, it's a mixed bag. If we, if we dive back into the history for a, a minute, I was also curious to just ask you about, because we've been focusing very much on New York and, uh, and the United States, but I, what about other scenes that were of interest, either musically or in terms of the visual arts? I mean, I'm really thinking about like the, the British post-punk scene, punk and post-punk scene, and the German painting scene. Like those feel like they were uh, draws. I don't know. I mean, I, uh, I mean, there's always this argument between <laughs> who started punk, you know, like England or, you know, was it at CBGBs? But we know. <laughs> it was Iggy Pop, okay, let's just say the Stooges. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, it, it meant such a different thing in England, you know, so the class system and, you know, it's just so different. But it's interesting that it, it all kind of started co coalescing around the same time. Yeah. Um, and it was anti-corporate, basically. In New York, it, you know, it seemed to come out of the poetry scene, more of the downtown art world. And I think Tom Verlaine and Richard Hill both moved there for poetry, or in a sense. Yeah. And in England, it was just like, <laughs> this is depressing. And <laughs> I don't know. You know, bloated corporate rock bands. And I, I, I can't really speak for... I mean, CRISPR knows more about the German painting. <laughs> yeah. I but mean, I, I'm always, I, I was always interested, it's always seemed to me that conceptual art artists in Germany um, chose painting more as a form of expression hmm. than, say, Americans or... Um, even Italian pro or Provera or, I don't know. Um, I was only, I, I became aware of at least my generation later than the period we're talking about in the mid to late 80s when I first went to Cologne and, and realized there were artists my age. It was quite exciting for me. There, were, there was stuff being done there that was, um, New. It, it felt it felt similar, um, uh, but it felt very advanced, and it was it was a uh, it was a generation a, a decade later. But it, um, it it left a big impression on me, uh, and and I it felt uh, I think Americans have been involved with painting, uh, but Ger yeah, I didn't mean Germany to say they also, weren't, but yeah. Was, but. yeah. Are there scenes around the world? I mean, has it just become a big um, global universe of things going on, or are there particular scenes in particular places that are extremely excited, particularly exciting to you right now? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get out much. Um, <laughs> I mean, I have friends, uh, you know, uh, artists and, um, you know, from New York who now come here a lot. So that's, I don't feel as disconnected from the New York art scene because I would probably, I I'm actually feel more outside of the art scene in L.A., um, really. I, I, for me, I, there was, I mean, to, to have moved to New York at that really exciting period, which I didn't know was there, and I, I think I read about the music stuff in the Village Voice, like everyone else. Um, but there was a point for me in probably the 90s where I just stopped paying attention. I, I could not bear reading art criticism, or uh, especially the I'm not going to we'll go there, but um, <laughs> I had been a fan of cinema, and I stopped, mm. I, I just kind of 
lost interest. First of all, I lost interest in reading about it, and then I, 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 I just stopped. I not stopped completely. Um, like music, I like movies, <laughs> um, but I'm not aware of what's going on, and I, that's partially age. I just I was. I, I learned so much from following things when I was younger, and something changed. Yeah, I think it's just different phases of one's life, and, and um, you know, that's just natural, I think. Yeah, I wonder, I mean, it, it's all, it, it is also a question of whether, like, the painting, there was more of a painting scene that was a scene, perhaps, at that time, and more of the music scene than that was a scene at that time. I mean, it feels to me like they mm -hmm. come up and they go away. Uh, and like, for instance, you know, 10 years ago, there was an incredibly exciting scene going on in Sweden of experimental mm -hmm. music and improvised music. And it felt like everything could happen. And there was all, and it felt mm -hmm. like that got really mm -hmm. kind of codified. And then that energy moved to, uh, to Norway. And then it's there for a little while, and it's then it and the London scene had kind of gotten fantastic for a long time, and then it kind of went away, and then it came back, and now it's incredible again. And and uh, I mean, painting is a little bit more of a solitary activity, and it feels like it's. But the yeah. the the situation in New York in that period felt to me that's why that interdisciplinarity is so interesting, is people were moving back and forth yeah. between things, except that. Um, uh, the 70s art world was very small and and not um, not really interesting. What happened was outside the art world and and eventually um, uh, eventually encouraged things. But um, uh, I was quite young. But um, uh, artists were not selling work or making a living mm -hmm. except you know the 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 real well known artists uh and so yeah <laughs> uh and that's almost flipped 180 degrees now i think yeah i mean it's i mean i hate to bring up the internet but you know <laughs> in the 80s um you know, people put up flyers when they're having shows, and that was that was a huge thing. You know, there'd be flyer wars, and you'd be out there in you know the middle of winter with a glue paste thing and just like <laughs> smearing it up and trying to do it quickly before your hands froze or the police came or or something. But and it was just like a different um, kind of communication and. Um, Oftentimes, a scene will develop around a club, much the way it did at CB's, and then you know, real estate changes, and that really then it moved to Brooklyn, and you know, because it's cheaper. And now I think, um, you know, and then the late '90s, the experimental, um, you know, kind of noise genre um, really just kind of started erupting because you could make it anywhere. You could just make um, you know, same with death metal. I mean, you could sit there typing a drum beat <laughs> in a dark forest or something. <laughs> and um, uh, so, again, it was this sort of you know DIY thing. It, you didn't even you didn't need a studio really or a big studio or. And you know, there are pockets like I think Detroit is and uh, is still like it's super in interesting there musically. Um, you know, I like that scene, and there is, um, you know, kind of a crossover with art there too. Um, but it it is um, really kind of hard to say what is. I mean, <laughs> you know, the art world is so commercialized in New York, and yet, you know, there's interesting things that go on and shows, and yeah. and part of it is kind of the relationship to commercialism or in spite of it. Mm -hmm. That's that's why New York is still so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So if we look back at the at that period in the seventies, you um, to be a 
painter or to be a musician was quite a similar choice. You were, you were an artist on some level. It changed dramatically. So music um, uh, places to have performance became economically impossible, mm -hmm. even, even in Brooklyn. There, there are very few venues now, yet we know what's happened with mm -hmm. galleries. And, and uh, you know, I, I never expected to, uh, for painting to be a livelihood. I, I, was, I was a kid and no mm -hmm. one sold art. That was just a given. Mm -hmm. um, that's changed a little and um, it's, uh, I think it, for the music world, it's, I, there's nowhere to play in New York, is there? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there are clubs, but you know, like Zebulon is a, was a club there that now is in LA and it's great because it's also like a, they were smart about the way they did it. They have a bar in front so they can like, local people can just go in and drink and they can make money and sustain a, any kind of program they want. Um, and I think, you know, honestly, I don't really know where people play. I mean, when we first started in the 80s, we often played in galleries. We, our first gigs were benefits. And um, probably some of that still goes on. I, mean, th I think that's really nice. Um, but, you know, honestly, we never expected to make money and I still don't expect to make money from music or art, <laughs> really. <laughs> Last thing, let's just talk about things that you're working on right now, each of you that you're really uh, engaged in and excited about. Mm. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just, um, well, I don't know, I just uh, had a show open in New York, and now I'm just concentrating on this, putting a band together to actually try playing these songs live that that I recorded and made up in the studio with this producer. And it's something I feel like I kind of need to do to conclude it. Um, but I also feel like, because it's maybe the most commercial thing I've ever done, I'm a little scared of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I'm trying to figure out how to make it my own the way I made the record my own. Tour starts in? What's that? When does the tour start? It starts? Um, later in May. Christopher, you've been making sc sculpture. Uh, yeah, I guess that, that's new. <laughs> um, that that was. <laughs> I I, I off, artists will get asked if they moved somewhere. I I spent a, a year in Italy on a scholarship once, and everybody asked how was it influencing my work, expecting me to be painting in. Pompeii ochre or something. Um, <laughs> but uh, actually, that's, uh, uh, there were many things that ultimately influenced me after spending a year in Italy, of course. Um, but Texas has uh, been a natural, uh, we, we have space and it's open and sculpture, it, 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 sculpture seemed perfect when uh, I started, when I got down there and started working but I don't, I don't really think it's a change. It's just a, it's just a variation of uh, my aesthetics and what I'm doing with it, are, I think, are, sim are similar. Yeah. Cool. Cool. <laughs> cool? Uh, I think we're going to ask for some questions from the audience. And that's what I understand. Although, producers of this event and I didn't talk about that specifically yet. <laughs> Why don't we do that? If you have a question, maybe put your hand in the air. There's one. We'll do this as a test case. <laughs> Stand up. I'll repeat it. Uh, 
Um, Did people hear that question? Oh, s it's about collaboration and specifically the collaboration with Chuck D. Yeah. Well, we were just uh, recording at a studio in Soho where Public Enemy were also recording. And um, I don't know, like I had written this song that had these um, lyrics that I was kind of a big, I was a fan of LL Cool J. And then I had the opportunity to interview him to write a piece for Spin. And I was disappointed to find out that he was into Bon Jovi. <laughs> I don't like I. So, I, I was interested in uh, his relate his how he worked with Rick Rubin and how much was his input and how much was Rick's, and um, I understand like they're big juicy kind of chords to work with, but, but anyway I got over it. But um, so anyway Chuck was there in the studio and we'd see him every day waiting for Flavor Flav for like eight hours or 16 hours. <laughs> what you know, time is it? would be there and you'd hear these big floppy feet <laughs> coming down because he had those big shoes down the stairs. And Anyway, so <laughs> he had some time. And um, well, I asked him if he would do, do, um, you know, do some kind of rap in the middle of the song. <laughs> and you know, we were huge Public Enemy fans, and we kind of felt a bond because their music was so dense. Mm. And um, so he ended up doing kind of a very cliched thing, you know, like, word up. And <laughs> but <laughs> it, it kind of worked. Like, he was kind of, you know, brilliant, and then he was the perfect thing in the end. Yeah. But, you know, it's, um, he was very generous to do that. Other question? I can't see you, but stand up and... I, qu I couldn't because it, it's actually an enormously long, endlessly long list. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, there are a few things. Uh, there was quite a nice uh, show in L.A. that uh, uh, called Oranges and Sardines at the Hammer where they actually asked six artists to um, try and curate a room of things they felt had influenced them. Uh, of course, you had to be able to borrow those things. So... But, but part of that, um, doing the catalog, I made a list of influences and it, it, was, it was long and it included everything from painters who I learned something very specific from to, to film, music, all kinds of things. Um, I think that's normal, but I, I did have a feeling, I've always had a feeling, I still feel it, that uh, the, the strongest influences may have been m my own generation, the, the, the people who were doing things. So uh, by the time I was in New York, minimalism was history already. It, it had happened, it had been done, it had been documented. But I, I found myself much more influenced by things that I saw that were new and often that was my, especially specifically about painting, that often was my generation. So Philip Taff had, was quite influential, James Nares, Bob Dober, uh, and we're all, we're all the similar age. And, and I think, and I don't know if everybody always feels this way, but our generation, it, it's quite, uh, impressive when you look, maybe not, yeah, certainly in music <laughs> also. You're looking at me like I'm out oh, of no, my no, mind. No, no, um, no, I'm just <laughs> wondering what you're gonna uh, say. <laughs> but, I mean, even if you look 
for artists who were born in 55, the year I was. It's a, it's a list. Mm. Oh, I'm talking to you when someone else <laughs> asks the question. Um, I don't know, yeah, it's hard, hard to say. There's kind of a long list. I mean, I remember going to see um, Pierre Le Fou, this good art movie, when I was 14 or 15, and that just kind of blew my mind and just opened me up to so many things. Um, and, um, you know, and then you yeah, had the Velvet Underground and Warhol, the factory, that was all very mysterious. And, um, and um, you know, Simone Forte, uh, um, Yvonne Rayner, like how is dance a film and these kind of interdisciplinary things I think I was somehow drawn to. I don't know. We're gonna do this next question and then I'm gonna run to the bathroom <laughs> and see if I can get back before the question's been fully answered because otherwise <laughs> you're gonna see a little puddle underneath me here. I, think I drank too much water just before coming up here so rather than be really impolite, I'm gonna be only partially impolite. Who's got another question? You mean now? So the responsibility of university and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll I stick this question out. Uh, I mean, I, I don't really know what universities I, I, do. But I, I think that the best schools are always when they have, you know, artists, real artists who practice out in the world come and talk or musicians or, you know, just, I don't know. People. Or as teachers. Or what? Or as teachers. Yeah. Real artists yeah. as teachers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, the thing is also, uh, I mean, I don't know. I taught classes at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago on you know, the history of rock. And there's obviously this funny thing of like teaching something, having this <clears throat> thing that is very, in a way, anti-institutional, or it has some institute, deep inherent institutional critique, suddenly becoming something that has a syllabus mm -hmm. and has, a, um, has a, 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 a curriculum attached to it. Um, and you feel it chafing against that. Um, and it should. I mean, it should sort of want to disrupt that in some way or other. Um, and so, I don't know. That, I feel like they have a little bit of a ant, uh, antipathy uh, built in with them. But on the other hand, there was, I was doing it because I did feel that there was a responsibility to have that history be something that was parallel to other kinds of musical histories might be people be learning about. And <laughs> I just learned uh, before we came on, uh, both Kim and I, fathers were university professors, but ironically, <laughs> that word again, um, I don't, I have no idea. I'm not involved with <laughs> university. <laughs> um, my father passed away, so I have no one to check with. I, know. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't teach, and I find it very difficult, but I, I feel guilty about it because, um, I had really especially unique experiences with a couple artists who were mm -hmm. teaching because they really believed in it, not because um, it was just a job to them. But um, I'm just not, not for yeah. me. Yeah, John Knight was a teacher of mine. Um, my brief stint at Otis, he was a guest teacher 
uh, guest teacher, and he, I think he influenced me and my art practice as much as anyone. Yeah. You want to go to the, you want to go to the, I think China? we're going to, I think we're going to, we're going to call it. I'm going to say thank you, Kim and Christopher and Broad. Thanks. Thanks, John. And you. <laughs> <laughs>